अच्छा जी जोजफ स्टिकलिट्स ग्लोबलाइजेशन एंड इट्स डिसकंटेंट्स सो डू एनी ऑफ यू नो वेयर हीज बोरोड दिस टाइटल फ्रॉम और वेयर इफ देर इज अनदर बुक दैट क्लोजली मैचेज टू दिस पर्टिकुलर टाइटल हु डज दैट बुक बिलोंग टू एनी बडी दिस अ बुक कॉल्ड सिविलाइजेशन एंड इट्स डिसकंटेंट्स एज एनी बडी हर्ड ऑफ इट यू हैव सॉरी क्लोज क्लोज बट नो सिगार दैट गिव्स यू अ बिग हिंट अबाउट हु इट वॉज नो It was Sigmund Freud, right? Sometimes a cigar is just a cigar, etc., etc. Close but no cigar. That was the pun I tried to make, which failed miserably. Anyway, globalization and its discontents by Joseph Stiglitz. Let's have a look. Now, who is Mr. Stiglitz? That I think is the first thing that we will begin. He is an American economist and public policy analyst who is a university professor at Columbia, and he's also recipient of the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences in 2001. and the john bates clark medal in 1979 highly decorated economist but most importantly he is the former senior vice president and chief economist of the world bank and is a former member and chairman of the us president's council of economic advisers so he advised bill clinton and then went on to become the chief economist at the world bank so he's not some small fry at some lums university complaining about how you people don't study etc like taimur ahmed he's big okay he's huge He is known for his critical view of the management of globalization. It's laissez-faire eco economists, whom he calls free market fundamentalists, right? So that's also another play, nice play on word, uh, on words, and of international institutions such as the IMF and the World Bank. There's a nice little video here that I've included, and uh, after the break, maybe if there's time, we can watch it. And I also put this younger picture of Stiglitz just because I found it, and I thought, cool, I'll put that in. So he says virtually every major meeting of the IMF and the World Bank and the World Trade Organization is now the scene of conflict and turmoil. Here you see a, a picture of an anti-globalization demonstration, and this is a rather peaceful picture. Here there have been violent protests or protests that have that, that that have attempted to go closer to wherever the summit was being held, and then they've been violently stopped by the police, tear gas, etc., etc. We've seen all of that. That's not a good thing. I mean, it's not a good thing that uh, um, it's not a good thing that they were violently suppressed or that that violence occurred. The protests themselves, in my view, are a good thing. Some good things have developed as a result of globalization. Noor, aap khush ho jaiye. Land mine treaties are a result of globalization. Um, debt forgiveness has been championed by many globalists, etc. Um, and also, uh, foreign aid, etc., has been discussed, increased. as a result of globalization there have also been many other things like uh, uh, for example uh, international labor organization international labor conventions conventions regarding chemical biological weapons etc we can maybe include such uh, things in the broader ambit of globalization some of them are older um, some of them are more recent however globalization has not succeeded in doing what we really wanted it to do and that was to reduce poverty nor has it uh, succeeded in creating stable societies these societies are very unstable the actual number of people living in poverty has increased by almost 100 million the total number of people again we're looking at the absolute number of people so while the proportion of people may have gone down the total number of people sadly has not gone down so russia had an extremely negative experience with globalization here are some of the failures he points to he could point to many others but this is just the introductory chapter so he definitely points to russia he says it's a huge failure of globalization for example while in the 1990s china's gdp was 60% that of russia by the end of the decade the numbers had been reversed russia's gdp is 60% of china's can you imagine and here's an interesting graph about russia this is uh, a long long time ago this is 1917 when the russian revolution finally occurs this is right after world war uh world war 1 and you can see the graph goes up uh it's interrupted again uh in world war 2 the graph is going up that soviet obviously from here onwards it's the soviet union we're talking about and in 1991 uh, um the the soviet union breaks up and capitalism is restored there's large scale privatization trade liberalization deregulation etc etc and the economy completely is destroyed it is such a huge dip in the economy that if you notice 
it's like a gigantic war taking place. Um, and it completely devastated that country when they went for what was called shock therapy. Shock therapy was an IMF program in which they basically said to Yeltsin and his economic advisors, take all your industry and privatize it in 90 days. So in three months, they privatized everything. The results were catastrophic, really horrific results. You can see them here. There's a very nice uh, book done by the UNDP called Transition 1999, in which they look at the economic, what happened to the, uh, to the Russian economy and to other former socialist economies. They were pretty much all destroyed and uh, didn't show any signs of recovery. This recovery, after 2001, is mainly driven by one commodity, and that is oil. As oil prices rose, Russia started making money again. But which, what was once a diverse economy has now become a single commodity economy, which is not a good thing either, which is highly now dependent on the price of oil. Price of oil goes up, Russian economy goes up. Price of oil goes down, Russian economy goes down. Okay? And the other major thing is, I mean, you, uh, uh, if you draw a trajectory and you see where the economy could have been had this privatization not occurred, then you see that this recovery is nowhere even close to where they could have been had they continued to grow at the same rate they were growing. So big disaster. East Asian currency crisis, points out, is another example where hot money comes in and hot money comes out. It's speculative money. Billions of dollars flow into a country. Suddenly, you know, the stock market is booming. Everything is booming. The, you know, uh, the economy is booming, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then people take their money out just as fast, and the whole economy just tanks. Question. Good question. So the IMF thought that um, the free market works better. At that time, the IMF thought and still thinks that the free market works better than government intervention. The free market works better than a socialist planned economy. If we have a free market, we'll have more economic growth, but there'll be more competition as competition forces capitalists. Competition will force capitalists to innovate. They will get better technology. They will lower their costs because they'll be in competition with each other, and that will make the economy grow. So not a very complicated argument, one we've heard before. And Russia was obliged to give in to those conditions? Uh, at that time, Russia, the Russian president and th those who were in power felt that the IMF was right. They were not obligated to do so, but they felt that they should because they thought that, had they made that if they make that transition, Russia will grow enormously as a, as a consequence. But they were proved to be wrong. Of course, once the loans were given, there were economic strings attached. But when Russia came out of, of uh, when Russia became a capitalist country in 1991, when the Communist Party was defeated, at that time Russia had no major loans, etc. That they were not, uh, they didn't resort to uh, the privatization because they had any debts to pay back or anything of that sort. They did it because they thought this was a great idea, not because they had any obligation at that time. Now, they, of course, a, it's a different story since then. Um, uh, you know that Russians today consider uh, this particular ep period and episode to be the greatest tragedy in their history. They say it was the worst period in their history. It really destroyed the economy, destroyed the state, destroyed education, pretty much uh, destroyed their uh, progress as a whole. No, I don't think it's a question of uh, economists. I think it's a question of political power. So the people who took power in Russia were strongly opposed to communism, socialism, etc. They were ideologically very much aligned with the idea that we want to restore capitalism. Capitalism is a, they were very much convinced that capitalism is a better system than socialism. And so they were driven by that, that, those, that uh, argument that capitalism is better. And of course, the people who were driving this were also the ones who were benefiting from capitalism. So while the economy was tanking in Russia, it's not the case that everybody was getting poorer. The people were getting poorer, but the people who got this, all the industries that were privatized, they became the owners of these throwaway 
at throwaway prices, they became the owners of these massive industries. They became billionaires overnight. So they were like, this is the best. We got to do this. So you got to understand that even any economic debate is also actually also a political debate. Because any economic policy is going to benefit one or another group of people. If you have a policy that shifts investment to Punjab, you're going to have Sindhis who complain, why is investment going to Punjab and not being shared with us, or Balochistan or whatever. If you have a policy which shifts investment to the, to the capitalist class or develops a capitalist class, you're going to have workers who say, we are the ones who lost out in this entire process. The capitalists will say, yes, this is a good thing. The workers will say, no, it's not, it's not a good thing. So you've got to understand that it's not a, just a question of, they didn't have good economists, but they had economists who were saying, this is the best thing. And yeah, we're going to pay a heavy price for it. There's going to be a big transition. But in the long run, we're going to be better off, as this was going on. In the long run, we're just going to be better off. By the way, when the Russian politicians uh, saw what happened, the parliament saw what happened to the economy, they all protested. The whole parliament protested. Guess what happened then? Yeltsin called out the tanks and had the parliament uh, uh, attacked by the tanks and had all the politicians arrested, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, you can see that uh, there were huge protests against this. But uh, he brought out the army and crushed it, including the elected representatives of the people. And uh, the West, uh, lots of Western academics wrote, "Well, to have freedom, you got to have a little bit of suppression." So you know they justified it basically. All right, so now uh, one of the central debates with respect to globalization is terms of trade. The biggest problem anti-globalizers say is that Western countries have pushed poor countries to eliminate trade barriers, but kept up their own trade barriers. The net effect was to lower the prices of some of the poorest countries in the world re received relative to what they paid for their imports. Drug companies in developing, developing world were making these life-saving drugs available to their citizens at a fraction of the price at which the drugs were sold by the Western drug companies. In the case of, and by the way, you know that the actual chemicals of which those drugs are often made are really much cheaper than uh, the price at which we buy them. And that's because the brand you, you pay money for the brand rather than for the actual chemical. There's a huge uh, sort of jump in the, pr in the price of, a, of the actual chemical versus the branded, you know, uh, goalie that you eat. In the case of AIDS, however, the international outrage was so great that drug companies had to back down, eventually agreeing to lower their prices to sell the drug at cost in late 2001. Moreover, hot speculative money pays havoc. So terms of trade, Third world countries often say are moving against them because the things that they produce unke upar protective barriers khatam kar diye jate and the things that are produced by the West and by the advanced countries they remain pretty much protected. Add to this the problem of loans and conditions. Globalization is the closer integration of the countries. This is Stiglitz's definition of globalization and peoples of the world which has been brought about by the enormous reduction of costs of transportation and communication and the breaking down of artificial barriers to the flows of goods, services, capital, knowledge, and to a lesser extent, people across borders. The three main institutions that govern globalization are, of course, the IMF, the World Bank, and the WTO. In addition, we have WHO and ILO and UNDP and UNCTAD, etc. They all play a very important role. However, Stiglitz says, market fundamentalism and conditionality undermines national sovereignty. So it would, have been good, it would have been a good thing, except that this globalization was done in a certain way by these people who were market fundamentalists, who imposed these things on third world countries, which destroyed their national sovereignty, their ability to take decisions for themselves. Governments take loans, but the poor people in the developing world end up having to repay those loans. Trade unions, unionists, students, environmentalists, ordinary citizens marching in the streets of Prague, Seattle, Washington, and Genoa, who have put the need for reform on the agenda of the developed world, have brought this to the fore, okay, we, the, global, the way in which globalization is taking place is not fair to third world countries and specifically to poor people in third world countries who may not even know that their poverty is a, as, as a consequence of globalization and because of the conditions imposed by the IMF. Many people are suffering in poverty, but if you ask them, do you know about the IMF? They'll say, ah, 
ठीक है ना दे माइट नॉट नो बट द पॉलिसीज आर मेड देयर इन द 1980s यू नो द आईएमएफ इंपोज दीस पॉलिसीज ऑन ओवर अ हंड्रेड कंट्रीज द सेम पॉलिसी एसेंशियली द सेम पैकेज एंड दैट इज सेट टू हैव कॉज्ड व्हाट वी सी दिस आल्सो अल्टरनेटिव और अल्टरनेटिव इंस्टीट्यूशंस और रीजनल काइंड्स ऑफ ग्लोबलाइजेशन फॉर एग्जाम्पल हेयर इज द एशियन डेवलपमेंट बैंक दैट्स देयर वेबसाइट एक्सेट्रा एंड सो द एशियन डेवलपमेंट बैंक सेज दैट वी प्रमोट द एशियन मॉडल वॉट इज दैट in which governments while relying on markets have taken an active role in creating shaping and guiding markets so state plays an important role in guiding the market um including promoting new technologies in which firms take considerable responsibility for the social welfare of their employees which the adp sees as distinctly different from the american model pushed by the washington based institutions so government must play an important role in developing the very markets that and in developing the very institutions that can create development so it's not this just that you leave it to the market just get the government out leave it to the market no government has to uh, in a certain sense you know uh, shape and move the market in a particular direction and i think that also answers one of the brilliant questions you asked last time what was it that the chinese dif did differently or what was it that east asians did differently what they did differently is right here that was the government and the state that was really directing shaping controlling sometimes stopping and sometimes promoting everything that was going on in, including the market itself now it might surprise you to discover that the imf was originally created with a very different purpose in mind it was not created with the idea that we would have neoliberal uh, policies of deregulation and uh, uh the uh, liberalization and privatization in fact the after the great depression pretty much the bulk of economists as well as politicians thought that uh, we cannot afford this again during the great depression capitalism was going down 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 there was widespread unemployment some say maybe a quarter to a third of the people in these industrialized societies were unemployed or underemployed and uh, at at the, at the very same time the soviet union was going great guns it was growing rapidly incredibly rapidly so in the 19 the whole 1930s generation as basically grew up saying that's a better model than what we have what we have is causing unemployment there's no growth this crisis upon crisis the rich are getting richer the poor are in terrible conditions etc cetera, etc cetera. and look at them they are industrializing their country at breakneck speed so that's what we got to have so they didn't have that necessarily that is they didn't really go for a socialist planned economy as such but they did go for what you would consider to be a sort of middle position which was developed by john maynard keynes keynes basically said that a market economy uh, the market itself do, can does not necessarily always clear in fact you can get stuck in a situation where aggregate demand simply does not recover and therefore the depression keeps getting worse and worse and worse and worse and aggregate demand just will not rise up again so what needs to happen is what keynes called demand management write that down that the state has to step in and it has to create demand in the market so that things are sold now in a depression what happens in a depression it's not that productive capacity is destroyed it's not that factories suddenly are unable to produce that many cars so what is a depression a depression is a situation in which there is capacity to produce the economy can produce thousands of cars but there's nobody is ready to buy those cars because they don't have any money and because they don't have any money to buy the cars then you don't make the cars you unemploy people and then people get more unemployed then they don't have any money then they can't buy the cars let's just assume that cars are the only thing we're buying and selling but it could be any commodity or all of them together so basically you get stuck in a cycle in which aggregate demand simply keeps at a very low level cannot recover and so you need to stimulate the economy how do you stimulate the economy the government steps in it says okay either we're going to have an expansionary monetary policy or we'll have an expansionary fiscal policy we'll borrow money etc and we will uh undertake big projects uh and we will pay people money for that we will employ people when people are employed they'll have money in their pockets they'll go to the market and buy stuff when they go buy stuff aggregate demand will recover when aggregate demand recovers you'll get out of the depression theek hai keynes even suggested i don't care what it is that you do with it 
build roads, build schools, hospitals, whatever you want to do. If you want to just dig up, you know, trenches and then fill them up again, do that. Just give people money so that the economy recovers. Right? Very different sort of mentality to what we have today in economics, which is, oh my God, we're not going to give any free lunches, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But Keynes was saying, no, you've got to stimulate the economy with this demand management. And that's what these countries began to do more and more. One of the things, of course, that happened was World War II, which itself was like a gigantic Keynesian program in the sense that the government had to take over big branches of the economy or had to uh, you know, make contracts with, pri with private contractors for arms, ammunition, boots, etc., all these other things. So that was like Keynesian demand management anyway. And after World War II, as they came out, capitalist politicians, etc., politicians in the West all felt that if the West goes through another one of these great depressions, capitalism will be finished. And that was no exaggeration. That really was what they felt because in, during the Great Depression, the communists had made huge strides in America and other places as people were getting unemployed. The Communist Party of USA, for example, in a couple of months added 100,000 people after the stock market crash to their, uh, as card carrying members. So these parties and organizations were growing in a huge rate and intellectuals, etc., were also supporting it a lot. So Keynesianism, in a certain sense, rescued capitalism from socialism. Had it not been for Keynesianism, capitalism would probably have gone through another one of these mass massive crises and would probably have collapsed. Um, so now the same thing, idea of demand management also had to be managed at the international level. So one of the uh, arguments that was advanced at the time is that as demand began to go down, countries began to put up protectionist barriers, which further propelled demand uh, downwards. And that caused the Great Depression to be even greater and deeper and more horrible. So what they would do now is they would create this fund in case there was any country that did not have enough money to buy, we will not, we will say, listen, we'll give you the money. Just like we were giving money to workers, we will give money to countries as well. Continue to trade with us at the international level, and when you can, you can pay it back. Now, these were very, very easy loans at that time. These were loans that were made that were soft. They were much, much below commercial rates, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the central idea behind the IMF, you may be surprised to discover, was also very Keynesian, that it would stimulate demand at the international level. So um, when necessary, it would also provide liquidity in the form of loans to those countries facing an economic downturn and unable to stimulate aggregate demand with their own resources. While IMF was founded on the belief that markets often worked badly, it now champions the opposite idea that market it champions the idea of market supremacy. So at that time, when the IMF was founded, it was founded on the premise that markets don't clear. That's why we need the IMF. Because we need to give people money so that you know, aggregate demand continues to, uh, continues to stimulate the economy. IMF, what is it? It's a public institution established with taxpayers' money from around the world. They assert their control through a complicated voting arrangement based on the economic power of the countries at the end of World War II. So it's not a democracy. Okay? In the IMF, the jitne paise daloge, utne vote milenge. So countries have voting rights, and they have voting rights in proportion to how much money they uh, give to the IMF. There have been some minor adjustments since then, but overall that's how the model works. And that's the founding meeting uh, where it was decided that the IMF would be created. So the IMF was supposed to limit itself to matters of macroeconomic, uh, to the macroeconomy in dealing with the country, that is government budget deficits, monetary policy, inflation, trade deficit, borrowing abroad, etc. And the World Bank had a different duty. It was supposed to be in charge of structural issues. Um, what does the government spend money on? For example, uh, the country's financial institutions, labor market, trade policies, etc. World Bank would often give project-based loans. So for example, Tarbela Dam. Uh, which was a very key project in the 1960s that allowed Pakistan not only to generate a lot of electricity, but also allowed Pakistan to give, to develop uh, um, two crops per year. The season, uh, initially we only used to do one crop a year, and now we could do two crops a year because we could hold water and then release it later for a second cropping cycle. So it played a very important role. 
have made with the help of the, interna with the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, which is the original name for the World Bank. All of this was basically driven by what we would call the G7, today the G8. That is the industrialized and advanced countries of the world. In 85, William Clausen and a new chief economist, Anne Kruger, an international trade specialist best known for her work on rent seeking, changed the course of the IMF. So in 85, in the mid 80s, a big change came over the IMF. And what was that? They saw government as the problem and recommended structural adjustment policies that began in 1986 and then swept the globe. Over 100 countries adopted these policies. And these policies were not made in accordance with specific countries. It was a one size fit all sort of solution. A purge occurred at the same time, he calls it a purge, in the World Bank and its research department, which was its think tank. By the way, the World Bank, the, the nara of the World Bank is, the slogan of the World Bank is that they want to eliminate world poverty. The bank went beyond just lending for projects now, after the 80s, uh, like roads and dams, etc., to provide broad-based support in the form of structural adjustment loans. But it did this only when the IMF gave its approval. And and with that approval came IMF imposed conditions on the country. So now IMF and World Bank start to work in tandem. They're supposed to be a bit autonomous. They have their own you know, domains. But now that's not the way things work anymore after the 1980s. If the IMF doesn't say this country has a clean chit, the World Bank also will not give money. That's how they work today. Here's some of the uh, major uh, sort of uh, uh, director uh, generals of the IMF, and you can see, see that they've gone, uh, what's the right word, um, what was it, uh, intersectional. They have more women now uh, than they had before, before it was all men. So Washington consensus. Um, Stiglitz, the chief economist of the World Bank says, there is no real evidence behind this new consensus between the, I sorry, there is no real evidence that this new consensus called the Washington Consensus, which is between the IMF, World Bank, and US, et cetera. And what is that consensus? Privatization, capital market deregularization, trade liberalization. And he says, there's no evidence that it spurs economic growth. In fact, the evidence is to the contrary. For instance, US and Japan had built up their economies by wisely and selectively protecting some of their industries until they were strong enough to compete with foreign companies. Liberalization has thus too often not been followed by the promised growth, but by increased Misery, Oof. sounds like some Marxist radical rather than the head of the chief economist of the World Bank. But there you have it. Small developing countries are like small boats, he says. Liberalization amounted to settling, setting them off on a voyage on a rough sea before the holes in their hulls have been repaired, before the captain has received training, before life vests have been given on board. The result for many people has been poverty and for many countries social and political chaos. Okay, you wanted, maybe you wanted to read that. 1% have more enough, the same amount of money. Sorry, twice as much money as almost 7 billion people. Yeah, good. <laughs> you, if you're part of that 1%, it's great. But if you're not, then it's really bad. <laughs> okay. All right, so the IMF uh, diet, slimming plan, you know, like uh, what's that diet called, which is really popular? Keto. keto. IMF's keto plan uh, is this. Uh, um, and Stiglitz says the problem with this is, firstly, they don't pay any attention to sequencing. What should come first? Should it be trade liberalization that should come first or financial liberal, uh, deregulation that should come first? They don't look at how, the, what the pace ought to be for different countries maybe, yes, in certain sectors you should do it, in other sectors you shouldn't do it. And there's no specificity of the country. You know, in, uh, in this very book, he points out that uh, in one of the IMF country reports, Accidentally, they were cut copy pasting from another country, and they forgot to change the name of the country. And <laughs> in the report on this particular country, the name of another country was written down. So he's saying it's like a cut copy paste job. You already decided that ye 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 karna, hai, and then you just give it to all the countries ye kar do, without looking at the countries in any depth. This is what's caused it exacerbated the crisis in Indonesia, Thailand, Argentina, and many other places. IMF has a lot of problems with governance, as Aapka ke naam Abdul Rahman pointed out. Here you can see each country's IMF quota determines how much it contributes, how many votes it has, and how much it can borrow. 
So EU member states have 32%, uh, US has 17% of the vote, Japan, Japan has 6.1%, China 3.7%, Saudi Arabia, etc., etc., Brazil, Korea at 1.4%. So that's how the voting votes. It's not an equal thing. It's how you give more money, you get more votes. That's how it works. So the, the institutions, these institutions are dominated not just by the wealthiest industrial countries, but by commercial and financial interests in those countries. And the policies of the institutions naturally reflect this. So it's dominated by not just the rich countries, but the rich people in the rich countries. By custom or tacit agreement, the head of the IMF is always a European, that of the World Bank is an American. At the IMF, it is the finance ministers, and the central bank governors. At the WTO, it is the trade ministers. So IMF, finance ministers of central banks of various countries, etc. At WTO, trade ministers of those same countries, etc. The, poli the policies of the international economic institutions are all too often closely aligned with the commercial and financial interests of those in the advanced industrial countries. It's aligned with their, uh, the rich people of those countries. That's the problem. Privatization often destroys jobs rather than creating new ones. Privatization needs to be part of a more comprehensive program. He's not altogether opposed to privatization, but he says it has to be part of some bigger sort of comprehensive program which entails creating jobs in tandem with the inevitable job destruction that privatization often entails. Macroeconomic policies, including low interest rates that help create jobs, have to be put in place. Timing and sequencing is everything. These are not just issues of pragmatics of implementation. These are issues of principle. Privatization is jokingly referred to as briberization because there's so much corruption that happens as a result of it. There's some fantastic work with respect to Pakistan's privatization and how much corruption, corruption happened there. And that's when the perception of corruption just boomed through the sky in Pakistani politics. Um, China is just dismantling its trade barriers 20 years after its march to the market began, a period in which it grew extremely rapidly. It never liberalized till very recently. So the net result is that IMF is working according to this fundamentalist vision, a kind of dogma. The dogma is get the, if you get the government out, automatically entrepreneurs who are really, really you know, smooth and glib will come into that vacuum and produce whatever it is that the government is no longer producing. It doesn't happen that way, he says. This is not true. For example, even in the US, it's not true. And the US has created several institutions to, to make sure ke, you know, where the market fails, the government is there to support people. Like, for example, uh, Fannie Mae is a very exa good example. That's the Federal National Mortgages Association. Private market did not provide mortgages at reasonable terms to low and middle income people. So Fannie Mae came in to give those loans, etc. So the net effect has been to benefit the few at the expense of the many, the well-off at the expense of the poor. And in many cases, commercial interests and values have superseded concerns for the environment, democracy, human rights, social justice. All of this has really not been looked at. And left with no alternative, no way to express their concerns, to press for change, what do people do? They riot. They fight. Sometimes with each other, sometimes with rich people, sometimes they'll come to areas where rich people live and they'll just break the billboards, etc. All of this has been done. So, solution. The one paragraph that he's going to give you is, look, East Asia, he says, has embraced globalization under their own terms and at their own pace. That's the key. Um, globalization can be reshaped. He's not against globalization. He says it, it's inevitable. It is inevitable. That's correct. But, it, but what shape does it take? It must be reshaped. And when it is, when it is properly, fairly run, with all countries having a voice in policies affecting them, there is a possibility that it will help create a new global economy in which growth is not only more sustainable and less volatile, but the fruits of this growth are more equitably shared.